participants in Christ. That's kind of a harsh way to start off right there, to call all the people of the Corinthian church, and they have big respect for Paul. He'd been there a year and a half, they had respect for Apollos, and he says, I couldn't even talk to you as spiritual men, or spiritual men and ladies. I'm sure there were ladies there too. But he had to talk to them like babies, all right? And that was a sad way right there. And it's not that they didn't know some things because it started off really complimenting these guys, <coughs> calling them saints, saying they were going in a good direction. It's not that they weren't capable. It's that they were choosing to be incapable and choosing to be like infants rather than choosing to live like adults and choose to live like people who are being changed and sanctified by the Lord. I wrote on here, they were inexcusably immature and if we don't use it, we lose it. Now I think about that with my body. I haven't been running too much lately, but I always think if I don't get to running soon, I probably will never be able to run again because I'm getting around that age where you stop running forever if you stop running oh, things. And, <laughs> and I tell you, how many of us if we, do, we know even with knowledge or with skills at work or whatever we're doing in our craft, if we don't use those things, we'll forget about those things. Things will slip on us. We won't be as tight as we were before. So we've got to use it, not lose it. These guys were kind of not using what they had learned, and they were losing things. He says, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now, you are not yet able. I don't want anybody to have to tell me that, that I can only drink milk. I want some more stuff than milk, all right? We can think about babies. Whenever we see a baby, and we will soon, because there was a baby born to somebody in our church here recently named Leah, and when she comes back with that baby, we'll all be able to ooh and ah, look at her baby, <laughs> congratulate her, and say, wow, is that beautiful baby. But when you look at that baby and it's drinking a bottle or however it's drinking, it's cute, it's something special, it's something sweet. But if you had a 20-year-old child and you were having to feed him a bottle or give him baby food, it would be something tragic, okay? Probably because maybe he's handicapped real bad or there's something wrong with a 20-year-old man eating baby food still, drinking baby milk. It's a sad, tragic thing. Nobody oohs and ahs at a 20-year-old like that. Anything, your heart kind of breaks and you want to pray for them and pray for their family to help them because that's so hard on them, all right? Makes me think of when I was a kid, there was a marijuana commercial of uh, two guys smoking pot together and that one guy said, you know what? Tomorrow, maybe I'm going to go find a job. And the other one says, yeah, okay. And then the mom comes by and they go, hey mom, how's it going? And you can see they're still living at home with mom at 35 years old, smoking pot and haven't got a job yet. Okay, that would maybe be like them still being like babies, all right, when they need to step up and mature. And good preaching in good churches, which I surely hope I give you this, if I don't, please tell me, should include both milk and solid food. It should have milk for new believers. It should have solid food for believers who are growing. If I only preach the most basic elementary things to you guys all the time, there'd be no growth. All right? Maybe I could make things real, real spizzazzed or make a big show or performance up here, and you would enjoy it, but it would be a sin on my part because you wouldn't be growing, you wouldn't be moving forward in Christ. Really, I feel that if you can sit through my church service and not feel convicted of any sin at all, I have done something wrong. Not that I'm trying to convict you of any sin, but as we open the Word of God, every single passage contains portions of the fallen human condition. And it's like arrows that stab into every single one of us. Every time I read it, if I don't have those arrows stabbing into me, I realize I haven't read it enough. Because I know I'm not perfect, I'm far from it, and I need to be changed by it as well. So every time I preach to you, I'm hoping I give you some milk, and I'm giving you some real food. And the babies, they can't grab onto the real food just yet, but I hope they're grabbing onto the milk, and then as they're able to, they start to grab onto some of that meat too. It says, For you are still fleshly, for since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like mere men? So here's the sign. You know, we're big picture of this chapter is talking about church unity. Last chapter was too, that we've got to be unified together, that we can't have all these divisions. 
Here is a sure sign given right in the scripture of symptoms of disunity. is jealousy and strife. Okay? Jealousy, you get jealous of somebody else, and then you say, you know what? I can do that better. I think it should be like this. I think it should be like that. And the next thing you know, everybody is dividing, and people are not staying together. All right? A big thing of a good church in the Bible is they're moving forward together. It's kind of like a war movement. In a war movement, we may go to the front, we may have a battle, we may take some casualties, but we care for our casualties. We don't leave them on the battlefield. Part of the Ranger Creed was, I will never leave a fallen comrade to fall into the hands of the enemy. And under no circumstances will I ever embarrass my country. That's part of the Ranger Creed. And as Christians, we should look at that as our heavenly country, and we should also look at that kind of thing as when we go out into this world and we're in that war, which every one of us is every single week, and we're getting beat up and battered and hurt, we should be trying to help each other, not just say, well, you know what, you messed up and you did that, let me kick you again, let me boot you some more, let me push you back out into the war zone and leave you in the battlefield by yourself. We don't want to do that. We want to love the folks, we want to help them, and yes, we are at war. We're at war against all kinds of spiritual powers and, and concepts and principalities and all those kind of things. But we have got to be connecting together and watching out for one another while we're out there. Okay? And it says here, like mere men, this basically means behaving like flesh in a fleshy way. Behaving in a very worldly way. He told the Corinthians, you were behaving just like mere men. Not like born-again Christians who are changed and renewed and different than anybody else that's out there. You're acting just like everybody else is, he said. And all this strife and jealousy among you, I can see it as <coughs> obvious. And these are believers. These aren't lost people he's talking to, okay? So we can apply this amongst ourselves as well, all right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be in the Bible. So, so we have these same things too, because we live in the same world with the same terrible things that were going on back then as well. Or when one says, I am of Paul, and another says, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? So if we're saying, like, I am of uh, John MacArthur, or I am of R.C. Sproul, or maybe you're saying I am of Joel Steen, I hope not. <laughs> but whatever you're saying you are, you're just identifying with men. And we don't want to identify with that. We want to identify with Jesus Christ. We want to say, I am a Christian. I'm a Christian is who I am. I, I met a woman at that place sitting next to me, and she asked me who what I was, and I told her, and I asked her who she was. I said, are you a Lutheran? Because there are a lot of Lutherans there. And she said, no, I go to a non-denominational church. I'm a Christian. And I said, praise God, praise God. As we got to talking, I found out she's the same type of Christian that I am right there. But that's how she identified herself, is I am a Christian. And only God should be set apart, okay? We don't put anybody in a position higher than God. We don't put any preacher, any teacher, anybody except for God in that place in our life that speaks into our lives with the extreme authority. And that's why whenever we read our Bibles, we've got to submit to it and let it speak to us. We can't read a portion of our Bible and be like, I really don't like that. I don't agree with it. I don't like the way it says that. What, what does it mean by that? I'm never going to read that again. I'm going to read something I want to read. We cannot do that. We've got to read it and let it work its way into our life and let it change us. It is the supreme authority above all things. We don't have a decision to pick and choose what we like about the Word of God. All right? We do have a decision to preach with what I like. You can be like, I don't agree with Buck, or I don't like this, or I don't like that. That's okay. Just please don't cause any strife and division in the church. If you don't, talk to me privately about it, and we'll try to work things out. But with God, we've got to submit. We have to believe. It's not a choice. If we want to grow and not just be babies all of our lives, I believe a person can be saved and ignore some passages of Scripture if they, if they know that Jesus Christ alone is who saved them, but they're never going to grow past a certain point. It's like they just got stunted. Like they started maybe... They always said smoking cigarettes stunts your growth, but I never saw a guy that was like three foot tall to smoke. But, but, but it's like that. You stunted your growth if you stop believing and submitting and allowing it to just speak into your life. You know, we talk about filters. You've got to be able to like take that uh, mesh screen that keeps the bugs out, that keeps you safe in your life, 
from all the bad stuff that's out there in the world, and even from stuff in the church with different doctrines, you've got to be able to take that screen off the window and just let that wholeness pour right into you, okay? That's how we have to be with the Word of God. We've got to let it pour into us. And sometimes we may not like it. Often it's going to hurt. You know, it's like uh, if you have a cut and you pour alcohol on it or, uh, or peroxide and it gets all bubbly and it's like, Ugh, it stings. But what does it do? It heals. It gets rid of the bad stuff. And often as we read the Word, it's going to be like that on us. And if it's not, then we're not going to grow. You know, we've got, we all need that stuff. And uh, so no one can compare to God at all. Nobody. Not the Pope for sure either. Okay, some people hold that as some higher thing. He is not any higher than any of us are high, okay? Everybody who confesses Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior is just as much a saint as anybody else is, Amen. okay? There is no difference, okay? If you're a child of God, you're a child of God. You're not a stepchild of God. You're not a child that's uh, being fostered that you may or may not get into the kingdom of God. You are a 100% child of God when you believe in Jesus Christ and confess Him. 100% in the kingdom. Even if your actions are messed up like these Corinthians are, they're still children of God. If they die, they're going to be in the kingdom of heaven, even in the messed up state. All right, here we go. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul? Servants through whom you believe, even as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. So look at this picture. I've got a lot of pictures today I'm trying to help you understand things with. All right? He's asking, like, what is Apollos and what is Paul? Okay, Paul's the one talking. He's saying they're just servants. That's who they are. They're servants. They're like conduits. They're like electric wire. They're like the brush. So picture a beautiful painting here. I don't know, some, uh, some different artists, a beautiful painting. Mona Lisa or something's right here. Has anybody ever seen a painting of the brushes that Mona Lisa was painted with? No. Nobody cares about the brushes. That's like you and I. That's like Paul and Apollos. They were the brushes. What they painted was the Word of God. What they painted was the Bible and the big picture. We're not to make statues and things of the brushes, all right? We need to look at the painting, look at the beauty, look at the Bible for what it is, and not lift up people higher than the Word of God, or even on the same level as the Word of God. We can say good things about it. We're like, praise God that Paul was such a man that he stood up and he was bold and he went forward. Praise God for you when you do those kind of things and everything. But you shouldn't be having some glorified picture of, well, this is this guy, let's stand, admire him, and worship him, or pray to him. All right, That would be horrible. It points out here that there is nothing but servants through whom you believe. And who made them able to do that? The Lord made them able to do that. And who made you able to believe? The Lord Jesus made you able to believe. So it's amazing things here. Ephesians 2.10 says that none of us should boast because it's all God. It says if any of us boast and say, hey, I am a Christian because I did this and did that, we're looking a lot like what Satan said when he said, I will do this and I will stand up and be like the Most High. Okay? We need to give credit to God and boast in Him. We can say, and then the Lord saved me. And then the Lord changed my life. And then the Lord opened up my eyes and my ears and allowed me to see. The Lord gave me the gift of repentance and the gift of faith. And then whatever other gifts the Lord has given you. He says, I planted in a polished water, but God was causing the growth. So no matter how skilled Paul was or how skilled Apollos was, they didn't get those people to be, to be more saved or more sanctified or more changed. It was God in the midst of it that was doing it. But they were blessed to be used by and for God, just as we are blessed to be used by and for God. And I guarantee every one of you has a story and is in life somewhere where Christianity is swooning around you. Every one of you is an ambassador of Christ, even if you're having a bad day. Even if you're like the Corinthians and have gone back to eating, drinking milk only instead of eating food, Christ, you're still Christ's ambassador, and He's still using you in whatever way He's desiring to use you, and this still His changes are going to come about. It says, So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but God who causes the growth. So it's given us a, basically a level of nothing. Every one of us is nothing in comparison with God. It doesn't matter if we 
did everything in the world, okay, world known, okay, centuries known. Maybe we'll go on for history for several centuries and be wrote about in the history. Maybe we'll be like Martin Luther, all right, incredible guy, 500 years now. This is the 500th anniversary since he stood up in his 30s and nailed those 95 theses to the door and said, I'm not going to be part of this corrupt stuff anymore. I'm going to stand up and I'm going to stand on the word of God. And I don't care what your tradition says. I don't care if you kill me. Because back then you would be killed when you stood against the church. And he did that because he believed. All right? And yet he was such an amazing man and yet he was not anything in comparison to Jesus Christ. And we should not be anyone, and I guarantee you wouldn't want to put him like that either, anyone above the Lord God Almighty. We're all on the same playing field. We may have some different levels down in the playing field, but it's still on this side of the playing field. It's not on God's side. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each will receive his own reward according to his own labor. Alright? So everybody is going to, we're all one team. One team. There's no I well, that's why I say there's no I in the word ranger. We would use uh, acrostics all the time, right? In the word ranger, you don't have an I. You know, it's about teamwork, right? Special forces, there's an I. But still, we were about teamwork too. But here in the church, there's no I. We should be working together in unity. We shouldn't be jealous and strife and causing issues. We should be having love toward one another. If we have an issue, we should go to someone lovingly and gently and let them know about our issue and be like, you know what, I'm having a real problem with this. And we can work those kind of things out, okay, and go forward. But we shouldn't be having all kinds of troubles. We're one. But yet at the same time, while we're one, God's going to look at each and every single one of us one day in the Bema Seat judgment, and we're going to get rewards based on how we work, okay? And I hope I get some rewards. And I hope you think you want to get some rewards as well. When I was finishing up the Army time, I actually worked two years in ROTC, teaching in Orlando, Florida, the college kids. And I was so shocked and disappointed when I found out when we went to do a PT test, physical training test, that all they cared about was what is the minimum standard I need to pass. You know, I need 37 sit-ups or something. I'm like, 37 sit-ups? A 10-year-old could do 37 sit-ups. What are you talking about? And this was their biggest issue, and it bothered me so bad. I hope that you are like a, more of a special forces mindset where you want to know what is the maximum so I know that that is my minimum because I'm going to do the maximum and then above and beyond that maximum. That's the kind of attitude we should have because one day there's going to be some rewards. Do we know what they are? Not really. You're going to have a lot of people tell you this, tell you that. Maybe they're more bright shining clothes. I don't know what they are, okay? But there's some kind of rewards, and praise God, I'd love to be able to get some reward in the kingdom of heaven. And if I get none, praise God, thank you, Jesus, that I'm there anyways. Okay, at least I'm there. But I want to try to strive to get something and go there, okay? And, and, I, and then, like I said before, we cannot help being something. Even when you're in your worst state, you're an ambassador of Christ wherever you go, and you're going to be something. You may not think you're anything. You may think, I am being a big hypocrite today. I'm way out in left field. There was times in the military where I lived like a hypocrite for a long time because I wasn't walking the right way with the Lord. And even after that, I talked to some of my buddies after I became a pastor and got saved. I was already saved. with renewed my life with Christ and everything. And you know what they said? They said, you know what? I always knew you'd be doing something like that. And I never told them that. But they could see that something I brought into the situation that I was going to be a preacher, that I was going to be a believer, that I was a Christian, even though I was keeping my mouth shut because I was embarrassed. I was sneaking off to church every week because I knew it was the right thing to do. But outside of that, nobody knew where I was with Christ because I was ashamed of the way that I was living my life. But I was still something to some people, believe it or not. It's hard for me to understand, but that's the way it is. When the Holy Spirit saves you and seals you and you're born again inside, even if you let all the flesh kind of overpower or looks like it's overpowering, overlooking, that new spirit within you, the Holy Spirit that dwells within you, you're still going to be something. It says, For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. So it says you are God's building. It doesn't say some fancy church building is God's building. This building isn't God's building. You are the building. What does it say in the Bible? It says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You yourself are. We as a body are, because we're gathered together, are God's 
building. And isn't that a beautiful thing that I could be, that you could be a part of the building of God, that he would love you enough to be like, hey, let me pick you up, you, you brick, you rock, and put you as a rock over here in my building where this is, belongs to me. What a beautiful privilege we have to be part of God's building. And it's only on God's building and this foundation that we're ever going to stand. Anyone else who is not a part of God's building is not going to stand. They're going to be like the guy that built his house on the sand. And it'd be like we saw the Puerto Rican and the, and the Florida and the Texas hurricanes and different things. I bet you there were some places that weren't as well built that went down a whole lot faster than other places did because they didn't have a firm foundation. But we're going to be like a firm foundation that no matter if a, a hundred foot tsunami wave hits us in our life will still be standing strong in Jesus Christ. Now, it may not appear that way all the time because maybe we'll, have, I don't know, bow to some pressure, have some hard times. But like I said, you're still saved. God's going to raise you back up again. The tsunami ain't run over you, but then all of a sudden it'll be like everything else is dead, but you're going to start to grow again because you've got Jesus Christ down in your heart and in your life. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds it. So God gives us some leeway in how we're building the building he's put us into. How, how what builds on top of us, how strong we are, okay? I don't want over there by the latrine, okay? I want to be a rock that's more like in the throne room of God or in a... At least a pleasant area, a nice area, okay? He gives us some leeway with this. As, so we've got some things of where we're going to be in our life and how our life is going to be built on Him. And like we said, the only things that really last are things that are built on the Lord. So it's our spiritual life. It's our life walking after Him. It's a life of, of not so much of dealing with, I want to be this in the world and that in the world and get all this success and all this money, but I want to be a solid Christian that grows in God. And how, what's my next step? And I'll tell you how you find your next step is from church stuff, Bible study stuff, but even most importantly from the Word of God. Amen. Opening this up and saying, whoa, boy, that doesn't fit my filter at all, I don't know. And letting that sink into you. Letting that change you so that way you can step up to the next level. You don't want to just stay at the same level. We want to keep building. We want to keep growing, you know. Is that there's a saying out there that if you're, you're not growing, you're dying, right? We don't want to be dying, we want to be growing, all right? And since God gave you the life, you cannot die. But it can appear that way to others, that's for sure. For no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ, all right? So if we try to lay a foundation of our own, if we try to be somebody special in the church and make it all about us, it's going to be wasteful. It's not going to matter at all. Okay, We've got to continually give it to God. Even in church planning, one of the best things I ever learned was if you're only worried about your church growing, your church will fail. You've got to be thinking about the kingdom, other churches, everybody. You know, some people come to me and they tell me they want to come to our church, this and that. They start to ask me about doctrine. And it may be a little bit different with doctrine. You know, Maybe they speak in tongues. I don't believe in speaking in tongues. I believe it ceased. I believe it was the first century. And they tell me it's very important to them. Well, I say, you know, there's a good Harvest Time Church in Brunswick. Someday God, they speak in tongues and they preach the gospel. Go on over there. Maybe you'll fit in better. Maybe that'll be better for you. Because they're still in the kingdom of God. All right? And that's where we've got to be. We're building it on the kingdom of God. And when we have that big picture and we let it away from just ourselves or me, and we make it about God all the time, that's where we ought to be at, you know. If you think about it, Noah only had eight people after a hundred some years of preaching righteousness. And if you think, was Noah a preacher? Read in Peter. It says, Noah preached righteousness. So Noah did preach in those days as he built the boat, and only eight got on the boat. If you think of Jeremiah? Man, they hated Jeremiah. They beat him up. They threw him in prison. They tried to kill him. They hated Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was a major prophet of God, okay? Then you think of other guys, uh, just even the apostles. They got a church of 3,000 in one day. Another time, 5,000 believers or something added to the church. All right? Different ways God does different things. We don't get to pick and choose how God does things. We need to make ourselves available to God and be who He wants us to be. All right? And we shouldn't get jealous about those things either. It says, Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, and precious stones, wood, hay, or straw... 
So it's talking about quality of building materials. If you're going to build a house here in Brunswick, I bet you would want uh, gold, silver, and precious stones. I mean, wood wouldn't be bad for middle of the way, but you surely wouldn't want to hang straw because they wouldn't, it would be rough. I mean, there's buildings in Afghanistan that are built with hay and straw that have lasted over a thousand years, but it's a mud hut. Nobody really wants to live in a mud hut, right? We want to live in something nicer than a mud hut. And eventually that mud hut, enough rain or something, will just make it back in the mud again, all right? Each man's work will become evident, for the day will show it, because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. So it's saying whatever we built our life upon, this foundation in our life on, it's going to be tested. And anything that wasn't built on the kingdom of God is going to be burned up like in a fire. So you may work on 10 PhDs and all this and all that, and if you don't have it toward God, it's all going to be gone. Everything's going to be gone. None of that's going to last. You go into eternity and think, wow, I lived on earth 80 years and only uh, a couple days mattered. <laughs> Only a couple of days I got saved and I and I and I got built by God for a few days and worked in his kingdom a little bit, but other than that, it was all about me and all about these things that I made, and it's all gone. And that's what it's gonna be like, he's saying here. And as I said before, we will have no opportunity to prepare after we die. This is the only working ground. And every one of us has been involved in things that we think, I wish this would be over with. I wish it would be done with. But then you know what? When you think about those things you're done with, and if you look back and you didn't hardly do anything on the things you were supposed to do, you're kind of ashamed of yourself. You're like, you know what? I should have done a whole lot more than what I did. Here I did. I did basically nothing. I got upset and I walked away from it. We need to be the type of attitude that we're going to do the best job we can with whatever we've got. Whatever God gives us in life, I'm going to do the best I can with that, and I'm going to do it for God. And hopefully, some of that stuff will pass through that fire into eternity, and there will be some stuff there too. Okay? I don't want to end up in heaven, and you know, maybe if there's uh, money in heaven or something, I reach in my pocket, and maybe I find a penny. <laughs> and some other guy reaches in his pocket, and he pulls out a, a hundred million dollars. And I'm like, wow, how did you get that? I spent my time serving Christ on earth. I, I did everything for him. And I'm like, well, Golly, <laughs> my, my penny. I don't want that to happen. I want to go into the kingdom of heaven as a rich man in God's riches, okay? Not in what this world has, but in God's eyes. It says, in, If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he will receive a reward. All right? So whatever it is that you did here toward God, it says you will be rewarded, and it's going to last on into eternity. Isn't that a beautiful thing? If you look for scripture back up on this as well, this is scripture, but more scripture, it talks about Revelation 22.12. That's the Bema Seat Judgment. And it's the judgment that all Christians will stand before. It's not the judgment that the world's going to stand before. The judgment they're standing before, they're going to bow their knee, confess Jesus Christ as Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and then they're going to be thrown all in the lake of fire that burns forever and ever that there's no end to whatsoever with the devil and all of his angels, all, all the demons. But the Christian judgment is a judgment based on rewards. And the Christian judgment is not one where God is going to shame you and God's going to be like, let me remind you of all your sins because it talks about rewards here. And if we really look at theology, if Jesus paid the price for all of our sins on the cross, why would he throw it back up in our face again and say, well, you know what? Look at all these sins he did. Okay, look at this. He did it. He did that to his own son on the cross. It's not a punishment judgment that we're going for. That's something that should cause us great peace and great joy that we know that the moment that we die, even right now, it should cause us great peace and great joy that right now I am no longer responsible for my debt of sin. Jesus took all responsibility for me and died on that cross for me. That's, that's, some, uh, that's an example of meat of the word. Meat of the word, you can say the gospel. The gospel, maybe somebody that's just on milk, will say Jesus died for me. That's the milk. That's the basic bare minimum. If you want to explain the gospel a little more, you can start talking about substitutional atonement. That Jesus was my substitute. I should have been on that cross. I should have been in hell forever burning for what I've done. Instead, Jesus was my substitute on the cross. He took 
Him, he took everything upon himself. They had things with goats in the Old Testament where one goat would die and one would get to run free. And the one that died was punished for the sins and the death went from the priest's hand into that goat and its throat was slit and it died and blood came out. And the other goat was the goat that got to run free because it was free because the penalty had been paid in this goat right here. That's like us with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the one who had the with, with the like example of that lamb, the throat slit, but he died on that cross for us, bled for us so that we could run free. And there will be no punishment in the kingdom of heaven for believers. But I still would like to have more than a penny in my pocket. Or maybe, I, maybe I'm being too, too prideful. May have more than lint in my pocket, okay? I want to have more than lint in my pocket when I get to the kingdom of heaven. So it says, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Now isn't this a beautiful verse? Even if you don't have nothing but a piece of lint in your pocket, not even that, you know? I got lint in my pocket. Maybe not, my wife does good laundry. But I got an empty pocket right here, alright? And I'm still going to be good. I still get to go into the kingdom of heaven, alright? I'm still making there because what Jesus Christ did in my life. Because I believed on him. It's not about my works. It's not about... The building that I'm trying to build and things like we're talking about, those are beautiful things. But that does not get me into the kingdom of heaven. And this one verse right here, I have to do this, is the Catholic Church's only verse in the entire New Testament to prove purgatory. And you know what? It doesn't talk about a time period at all. There is no time period listed here. So it is a bogus, terrible heretical doctrine that they teach when they teach that. And you know why they teach that? Because they want to try to control their people and make them think, you know what? You better be better. You better come to our church more. You better give more. You better do these things because you're going to burn in purgatory for a whole lot longer if you don't. All right? And if you remember back to Martin Luther, which I tell you, am I fired up? Do I like this guy? Can't say I stand with him on everything, but I stand with him on being saved by grace and in Christ alone. And he had this guy that was going around and he was throwing, having people throw pennies in the coffer. And they said a penny in the coffer gets, uh, gets light years off of your loved one's burning time in purgatory. So give some money. And how many of us would feel bad if our mom or dad died or somebody and we were told by the church that they're burning in purgatory and if we give a little bit of money, we'll help them out. We probably would be pretty inclined to do so, even if we were dirt poor and had nothing. Well, that Martin Luther had this situation, and it infuriated him, because as he watched them build the giant building that's still in Rome today, with everybody's little pennies that they gave off, and they had multi-millions of dollars of things, while the people were suffering and starving, and they were twisting the Bible to take it to their own advantage, it made him furious. If you read the 95 Theses, which if you have have this, it's in the back of your manual here, okay? It's not exactly what I thought it was going to be when I read it, but about half of it is all about this purgatory stuff and paying money for salvation and all kinds of filthy, terrible things that was going on, and he hit him straight out with it right there. He changed the world as a one man that stood up, one lowly priest that stood up and said, I believe what the Bible says. I don't care what you say, I believe the Bible. And it changed the world. And like I said, this verse is the one verse they'll use for purgatory. And if you look at it, even from any kind of scholar that doesn't even believe in God, but is a, a biblical scholar and knows how to read Greek, looks at this, there is no time frame in here whatsoever. So it's a huge lie. And what they call that in theology is eisegesis. Okay? It sounds like Isis, does it? But that has nothing to do with Isis. Eisegesis is when you put meaning into the text that you want to put meaning in there. It's a dangerous thing we all must be careful of. Exegesis is when you draw out from the text what the meaning really says. We have to be very careful that we're not doing eisegesis. And that's exactly what happened with that doctrine of purgatory. Because you don't get that at all from reading this right here. Because there's no time period, there's not anything. And if we look in context, we've been talking about building on the kingdom of God. And we haven't been talking about anything. We've been talking about how we're going to be in the kingdom of heaven. And it says here, for he himself will be saved. You know, you're going to be saved. You're not going to be punished for your sins. And even at that, it spits in the face of the good doctrine of theology in the Bible of Jesus Christ paying all your sins for you. Because if you have to go pay some of your sins as well, then obviously Jesus was not God and he did not pay your price in full on the cross. So it's ultimately spitting at the most foundational thing of salvation that Jesus Christ 
saved us, that Jesus Christ paid his price for me. Amen. And we try to say that I've got to go pay for myself a little bit. We're talking about rewards here. We're talking about something in the pocket here. We're not talking about that. Like I said, I'm, I'm giving an example of the pocket. I don't know. Maybe there's no money in heaven. I don't know what these rewards are, okay? But there's something that's a reward, and we can grasp on that concept. Do you know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. So he reminds him that, okay? Okay, the Spirit of God dwells in you. And just let that soak in. Let it bask for a minute. God dwells in you. Can you imagine that? God Almighty, the creator of the universe, right now is inside of you, if you are a believer today. Inside of you. I mean, this is astronomically crazy to anybody in the world, that's for sure. But God Almighty, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, dwell within you. How exactly? I don't know. That sure is a great mystery. But the Bible says it, and I believe it. Because it says that the Spirit of God dwells in me. It says it right here. Okay? This is Bible. If you've got your Bibles, you may have different translations. It still says the same thing. The Spirit of God dwells in you. Amen. All right? What I like to say to my Pentecostal friends, and I hope I'm not hurting anybody's Pentecostal here today, but Romans 8, 9. Romans 8, 9 says that everyone who is saved is in, has the Spirit of Christ. What's the Spirit of Christ? The Holy Spirit. Okay, we've got the Father, we've got the Son, we've got the Holy Spirit. Every single person who's a believer has the Holy Spirit. I don't need to get a baptism in the Holy Spirit some later point in time that I may or may not ever get or be empowered with. i got it all right now. I got it the moment I was saved, the moment I was justified, the moment I first believed. I had everything I needed. I could step off into eternity the next second and be in heaven forever. Okay? I didn't need to go earn anything. I didn't need to go get some second baptism in the Spirit. Sometimes some Pentecostal folks ask me, are you baptized in the Holy Ghost? And I want to say, yes, I am. But I know I have to kind of clarify that because they're going to think that I think the way they think. And I have to bring in the Romans 8 9 and say, the moment I was saved, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit just like you were. If you're saved and professing Jesus, I've got the Holy Spirit. I sure do. Some of those folks think we don't even believe in the Holy Spirit. By all means, we believe in the Holy Spirit. To say that would be to say we don't believe in a third of the Trinity. But we do, all right? But those are still our brothers in Christ and our sisters in Christ. Don't go to your Pentecostal friends and say, oh, you a heretic? Well, they all agree with how they view that. But whether they view it, however they view it or not, if they're confessing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they are saved. Mm -hmm. Even if they don't know that they're not waiting until later to get this baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they think that maybe we're not yet because we haven't got it yet. They're still our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to see Him in heaven one day. If any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. All right? This is a big deal. God will destroy him. We surely don't want to destroy the temple of God. We don't want to destroy ourselves. What does it say is the temple of God? It says we're the temple of God. We're the building of God. Big picture, this is talking about church unity. People trying to destroy a church and, and, and cut it up or do something, that's a bad thing right there, okay? We need to be working together for the church, unifying the church. Don't need to be splitting it up and causing problems. And I wrote that division is inevitable when there is a low view of Scripture, all right? One thing I loved about reform stuff is reform stuff, one of the basic pictures of Reformation and Reformed theology is that the Bible is at the top. The Bible is like, like if you look, they kind of go by like what Nehemiah did, and he got up on a big elevated platform, like you see maybe in these European churches, and he's got from there the Word of God, and he opens it up and he reads it before all. It's not that Nehemiah was elevated, it's the Word of God that is elevated. And in the Reformed realm, this means everything. It throws away tradition, it throws away culture, it throws away anything everybody ever thought. This does everything right here. And if it's not in here and doesn't agree with this, then we don't agree with it. And we don't stand on it. We feel like Martin Luther. Okay? He said, when they hit him up and they said, are you going to recant of all these books and things you've written? Are you going to change your mind? Are you going to do it? And he said, unless you can prove to me by Scripture that I'm wrong, I cannot and I will not. And that's the kind of strong stand we need to take in life too. This is the supreme Scripture. Do we worship the Bible? No, we do not worship the Bible. We worship the God who made this Bible. But this is the in-between part. 
The in-between part isn't some saintly picture on the wall that I'm going to go and pay homage to, okay? The in-between part's the Word of God, and the only way it's going to even help me is if the Spirit of God has opened my eyes and opened my ears and allowed me to understand it and to be able to ingest it into my life and is able to convict me and stick me with all these arrows and be like, oh, and I look for the healing from it as well, and then as the arrows fall out, I get a nice strong patch right there, okay? And I'm able to move on and I get stuck somewhere else later, but at least I'm strong there now. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you thinks that he is wise in this age, he must become foolish, so that he may become wise. This doesn't make any sense to the worldly people, right? They've got to become foolish so they can be smart. They've got to give up everything they know so that they can grab onto this. Man, that's a scary time, and it sure isn't easy either. I tell you what, this is another reason why you can know if you're saved today, that you're saved by Christ alone that He's the one who saved you, that it was a divine miracle that He performed inside of you, and it wasn't just you, because you would not have decided that everything you were doing and walking in life was wrong if He hadn't opened up your eyes and saved you. And that's exactly what goes on here. So to me, it's like the, it's like the rich man, the, the, Jesus, the rich young ruler came to Jesus, and he said, oh, I do all this stuff. You know, I've got this giant building of works on the kingdom of God. He goes, sell everything you've got. And follow me. And he said he walked away sadly because he was a very rich man. Because he wasn't willing to give up what he had. He wasn't able to become foolish so that he could become wise. Does that mean you should do that? No. Okay, this was a situation-specific guy. Okay? You should support your families. It says in the Bible that if you don't support your family, you're worse than an infidel. Worse than an unbeliever. Alright, so don't take it as that. But take it as the point that you need to be willing to give everything up. I don't know if you've heard me say it before. Hopefully it doesn't offend anybody. But there was a movie named Heat. And man, I like these action type of movies. And it's a bank robber movie. And the Val Kilmer and our, our Al Pacino and, and uh, the guy that looks just like him, Robert De Niro, are in this movie. And, and one's talking to the other guy, or maybe he's talking to Val Kilmer, and he says, if you're in this business of bank robbery, you've got to be the type of guy that's willing to drop everything in 30 seconds and move out. Everything in your life's got to be gone, and you can move out. And really, that's the way it is as the Christian. We've got to be able to love God so much that no matter what in our life may seem close to us, we've got to be able to let it go and follow Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is tremendous right there when you think about it. And the only way that's going to happen with anybody is that the Holy Spirit of God enables you and helps you to do that because you're not going to be able to do it on your own. All right. But if you ask God, it says God will give. It says if you ask Him, He gives. So what do we do? We pray and we say, God, help my unbelief. God, help my walk in you. And God surely will answer those prayers. All right, and I wrote here, invariably when the truth of Scripture is not the sole authority, all we have is man's opinions to go on. And that's a sh shaky ground, okay? Shaky ground, man's opinions. Man's opinions are like purgatory, okay? Make up some phony stuff. You've got to pay a lot of money to get your relatives out of purgatory. All some verse says, nothing to do with any sense of time whatsoever. Okay, those are man's opinions, and look at the trouble and the pain it's cost people. How many people, maybe, kids starved and died because they gave all their pennies so their loved one could get out of purgatory and suffered and died themselves because of somebody's twisted lie? So we got to be careful. It's not man's opinions. It's what the Bible says. We need to be very careful on following the Word of God. You can never fall to man who says, I am following the Word of God. I can't listen to what you're saying because I... And following the Word of God. Well, praise God, even if you're different than me. That's what's important to you. Praise God. And that's a good thing. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness before God. For it is written, He is the one who catches the wise in their craftiness. So, the smartest stuff on this world, God calls foolishness. Okay? The, the smartest man we know. Foolish is what He says. Okay? He says He catches the wise in their craftiness. He catches them like a... Like the way a hunter would, would catch a deer, or a hunter would catch a fish, a fisherman. He just catches them, right? A great place that, that, that lines up with this, if you like the book of Esther, is chapter 7, verse 7 to 10. And it's when, it's when uh, Haman, who's all proud, and he's made his, his 50 cubic... Do I have my cubit? I sure do. Oh, I'm not glad I get to use it. He's made his 50 cubits, so 50 of these tall right here, which is like a man's arm length right here. All right? They're a little bit bigger man than me. I think they thought Noah was 6'3". So here, a man's cubit, a cubit, 50 feet tall, he made this spike, and he's going to shish kebab uh, Mordecai on this spike. And then he goes to this special dinner with Esther and the king. 
and the Esther and the king, and he thinks he's going to be honored, and all this great stuff going to go on. And then when Esther says, and you know what, king, this guy Morde this guy Haman right here just made had you sign this edict to kill every Jew in the land, and I am a Jew, and so is my family, and they're all Jews. And then the king gets mad, and as he steps out, Haman falls onto the queen's lap and starts begging her mercy. King turns around and thinks he's trying to come on to the queen or make some kind of move that's inappropriate on the queen. He goes, how dare you do that? And they tag him and they bag him. They put a, they put a cover over his head and they carry him right out and they stick him on that same spike that he made for Mordecai. All right, And that's, that's what this is like right here. That God catches those who are wise in their own craftiness. He thought he was going to be smart. He thought he was going to kill this guy Mordecai. He ended up dying himself on that spike. And most people don't know the rest of the story of Esther because they don't tell it in the children's books. But in the end, a lot of people die that were against the Jews. And all ten of Haman's sons are also put on that spike as well. All right, So justice is served, and it's in a very extreme type of way. And apart from divine truth, we are fools with empty thoughts. So basically, it's nice to know a lot of stuff in the world. It's nice to be able to do what we do in our trades and our craft and different things. But if that's all we got... It's just all going to disappear, and it's a bunch of emptiness. All right, it is so critical that we're building on this house of God within our lives. And again, the Lord knows the reasoning of the wise that they are useless. Now, look at that word "useless." That really stuck out and grabbed me when I read it. God says the wisest guys on this earth, their wisdom is useless. Useless, isn't that something? I mean, things we would think is really important. How many issues, even social issues today, or something that we feel so strongly about, and yet? God says it's all just useless if it's not built on me, all right? That's probably a good perspective to hold on to. We've got things in the society that are dividing us from different things. Let that stuff be seen as it is here. It's all useless, you know? It may seem like a whole lot right now. It won't be 50 years from now. It won't be a uh, thousand years from now, for sure. It won't even be remembered right there, okay? Human philosophy is totally inadequate to bring men to God. You can't just study philosophy and bring somebody to Jesus Christ on that. It's got to be God bringing them there even with all the logic philosophy can have. So then let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world, or life or death or things present or things to come, all things belong to you. Isn't that beautiful? So here's the church getting beat up real bad. I mean, Paul's like out there kicking them in the shins and maybe kneeing some of them in the head and punching them and saying, look how messed up you are, church. And yet, look what he says here at the end. He says, all things belong to you, whether in death or present, life, this world, whatever. You've got it all. And why do you have it all? Because Jesus Christ chose you, he saved you, and he gave everything that he had and paid the price for your sin. Amen. And if you look in Philippians 1, 23, 24, and I know i got a guy out there who knows Philippians 1, 6 really good. All right, this line's right up in there. Philippians 1, 23, 24 says that death is better than life. It's better than life, Okay. It made me think of our brother Andy Parker, not here with us anymore, died just a little bit ago. And it made me think when I read that, I think I know he is in a better place. Because he's a believer, and he's where death is better than life. There's no more struggle, there's no more fight. He is free from everything. And the same thing goes for you and I. All right, When we are believers, we are free. Even though all this messed up stuff can be going on in our life, and if we say we don't have messed up stuff in our life, we're not looking too close in our own lives, okay? Look at your neighbor, and you'll find messed up stuff, and then look back at yourself and realize it's just as messed up stuff right here as there is in my neighbor. Probably more, okay? And that's the right kind of humble attitude we got to have. But death is better than life. Does this mean you should go kill yourself? No way, okay? The Bible's way against that. We already read about don't destroy this temple, all right? You can look at that that way, too. We don't want to destroy ourselves, okay? We want to keep going on because it's God's will that we keep going on. It's a miracle every day that we draw breath. And we want to keep doing what He wants us to do. All right? And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. Isn't that beautiful? You don't even belong to yourself. And you belong to the King of Kings. Not some slave owner or somebody that would hurt you or abuse you or have bad ideas for you. But somebody who loves you and wants every good and perfect thing for you. So the Bible says, every good and perfect thing God wants for you. He doesn't want to cause you all kinds of troubles and issues for no reason. If he's doing any of that in your life, there's a reason. And it's a big reason. And you may never know on this side of heaven. On the other side, 
You may be one of those guys with money just popping out all over the place or something, okay? Because there was a reason behind it. And I guarantee you, everything, when we go to the other side, we're going to look back and be like, thank you so much, God, that you did this, that you Amen. did that. Even how hard it was on me or my family or whoever it was, I know that you had me in the palm of your hand and that you love me and you want every good and perfect thing for me. All right? And you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God and that's where we're at. So here, my question to you today is, who do you belong to? This is the big question of the day. And I tell you, this is the most important question of your life, okay? If you don't know, that who do you belong to? Now, I wrote the emphasis on gratitude that drives the Christian life. So are you serving God so you can get more riches in heaven? No, okay? It won't work like that. You'll get burned out pretty quick if that's what you're trying to do. It won't last. You serve God because you love Him so much. Uh, example, if, if somebody, if you were drowning, okay, if somebody pulls you out of the lake, some ice cold lake around here in the wintertime, and you were drowning, and they pulled you out of that lake, and they did some CPR on you, and they got you back alive again, that'd probably be your friend for life. You would tell everybody, this guy right here saved my life. He did all kinds of things for me. I was about to be dead, and he saved my life. You'd have gratitude. If he said, hey, can you help me mow my lawn? Hey, can you help me uh, build my barn? Hey, can you help me uh, do this or do that? You'd be like, sure, I can. I'll rearrange my schedule. I'll do whatever I can for you because I have gratitude towards you. And this is how we serve Jesus Christ. We love him so much because he first loved us, because he saved us, that we serve him in gratitude. If we need more incentive, we have missed the most foundational logic of the gospel in Romans 6, 1. All right, you may say, well, what is Romans 6, 1? All right, and that says that, you know, shall we continue in sin, that the grace may abound? It says, by no means. All right, so we shouldn't say, well, you know what, since I know I'm good anyways, I can just do whatever I want. You know, we shouldn't do that. And, and if we miss the incentive right there because of gratitude, that's easily where we're going to slip back into because we're all going to do a little like a diet, okay? I don't know. Some of you guys may be successful at diets. <laughs> I'm about successful to tell you guys about it, and then it doesn't even happen. <laughs> all right, maybe one day I'll be more successful. But if we're trying to serve God for rewards in our pockets, that may be the kind of, that kind of thing. Like I'm making a New Year's resolution, and then bam, what happened with it? Okay. So, so what we need to do is we're serving God because of gratitude and because we love Him, and that's the kind of drive that will help us to continually grow in God and keep going and going. Not because He's going to punish me, not because I'm not going to get enough rewards in the kingdom of heaven, because we love Him. Doctrine of grace is the watershed that separates Christianity from false religions, all right? And I love that term, doctrines of grace, all right? That goes back to my reformer stuff. But i got a lot of friends that aren't reformed, and they still love the doctrine of grace too. Because the doctrine of grace is that Jesus Christ died for me. He was my substitute. He did everything. It just like I saw in that play, and at the end, and it was all built up, and, and we were like, wow, Martin Luther really did write something. He had read all these excerpts from his book about the lies with the Jews and what he said about the Catholics. And some of it was extreme, all right? And everybody looked like, oh, man, you got it. It looks like you won. And then when he started hitting his accusations to Peter and everybody else, and you can see it, how evil those accusations were, too, from men who loved God and followed God. And then we saw grace. And grace was the whole difference. And the devil didn't have any grace, okay? For whatever reason, God didn't put any grace upon the devil. But he put him upon all these other believers right there. And even though they were messed up, they had his grace. And that's what separates us from false religion. The false religion will say you have to go door to door every day, and you have to do this, and you have to do that, or you're not going to make it in the kingdom of heaven. That's a false religion. A false religion will say we have to pay this much money, or you're not going to make it in the kingdom of heaven, or you've got to be just like this, okay? And then how many people are really like that? They may look like they're like that. They may be good uh, trickers, good fools, good deceivers, okay? But nobody is perfect. None of us are perfect. We're all going to fall short. And if we're honest, we're not going to make it. Like I said, I've talked to devout Muslim men with their little white hats and stuff like that. You can kind of see through the top and their white man robes and stuff. Not white man, some of them are dark men, but they have big white robes and things. And, and these guys, if you're honest, you ask them, like, hey, if you die today, would you go to heaven? They're like, I don't think I would because I haven't been able to pay the balance of my sin in my life yet. And these guys do all their prayers, their washings. I sat in the, the, the bathrooms with them, guarding them in Afghanistan. They think that they love God. They think they're doing everything that they can to go to the kingdom of heaven one day, but they're doing it without grace. 
It's without the grace. It's all about the grace. And when you grab that concept of grace, that Jesus did it all, and you didn't do anything at all, and all you got to do is believe on him. It says it's the only work you have to do in John 6 to believe on him. It's amazing. It's overwhelming. And that's salvation when salvation starts. And that's also growth. If you, need, if you get down in the dumps and you have a hard time, just start to think about God's grace in your life. And think about what he's done for you and how much he loves you. And you'll be able to get through that hard time. You'll be able to have that little extra oomph to keep on going. And uh, that was the, the end of the play that I talked about there too. So that's what happened. It was incredible. I recommend you see it. I don't know if it's on YouTube, but it's one of those things probably where if you're not there, you don't grab the whole experience of it. But you can still watch it. I think you'd like it. And so, and the same way with the ark. Okay, I highly recommend you guys go to the ark where I got this fancy thing right here. <laughs> Bill Price went to the ark, okay? <laughs> I went to the ark with Bill Price. But it's an experience you'll never forget. And it'll help you grow in God and it'll strengthen up your faith and help to answer more of those little dot to dot questions in your life of the why. Because the more of the why we know, the stronger, short up, we're secure and know that we're standing in the right way. And the only way we're going to know more of the why is by looking at the master book right here. Okay? It's going to help us out. What's that? Oh, yeah. And uh, as I close, we'll pray. Uh, our brother Zach, who plays the Kuhun over here, you know, you know Zach, I think everybody here does. His mom is in the hospital right now with uh, seizures she's been having now. She's got tumors of cancers. On her, on her liver and on some other places in her body. And uh, her and Zach are very close. He loves his mom like crazy. And it's a very hard time for our brother Zach. So, so we'll pray for him right now. Anybody else have a prayer request? Prayer request, Jen? For my client, Bill, he, he has stage 4 cancer. Okay. That's a big deal right there. I've never met anybody from stage 4 cancer that wasn't having a short time right there. So that's a hard way for sure. Anybody else? Enzo. Carmine. For Carmine. A young man that's uh, jumping out of airplanes from 18,000 feet in the sky. It is very dangerous where he's at. I think the guy dies every year or two in that school, actually, where he's at. All right. So we'll go ahead and we'll pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the power of your word, Lord, to reach deep down into our hearts and touch us, Lord, to help us to grow, to open up our eyes and our ears, that we may know you and know you more, Lord. Lord, thank you that, that this passage about church unity, help us to be, continually be a church that loves one another. Help us, Lord, to be able to reach across the bridge, reach across the street, reach across the divide from our different lives and our different ideas and different places where we may be and be one together as the church, Lord Jesus, and move forward worshiping you and not be held up by, by useless small struggles and different things amongst each other, Lord. Help us be a team that gets along together, Lord. And Lord, I also ask you for, for our brother Zach, Lord, Lord, that you would be with his mother, Melanie, right now, Lord, as she's in the hospital, as she's been now having seizures, as she's having so much pain, of all the things that she's going through, and the pain that it's causing him, I know, is tremendous, Lord, and I imagine his brother and his father are in tremendous pain as well. I ask that you be with them, that your Holy Spirit would comfort them, and that you, with your grace, would abound in this situation, Lord. Whatever your will may be, Lord, that if she would get better or anything, Lord, but as long as you are there, Lord, and that you would give your comfort to them, we ask you, Jesus, that you'd be with them, that you'd comfort them, that you'd help her, Lord. Help her to be able to come back home again, to be with her husband, Lord Jesus, and to have peace, Lord. And Lord, also for, for Bill, Lord, help Bill in his stage four cancer. You know him inside and out, Lord, and you know where he is with you, Lord. If he's saved, Give him more strength and bless him and help him, Lord. If he's not saved, Lord, please open his eyes and his ears and save him in these days that he has that are numbered, Lord. All our days are numbered, but so much more do we feel the number of our days when we have a declaration like stage 4 cancer or something, Lord. Lord, be with him and strengthen him and strengthen his family, and may you be glorified, Lord. And Lord, for our young, young brother Carmine, Lord, who's in the Halo School and doing so many dangerous jumps and different things in the middle of the night, Please protect him, watch over him, help him, Lord, not to, not, to, not, to, not to be hurt, not to have a broken leg or a broken elbow. Help him be able to do all the things that he needs to do. Lord, let no uh, natural disaster come upon him. And I just ask that you protect him and watch over him and help him get through this school. And help, help Enzo as well as, as he prays for his son and he loves his son and he cares for him, Lord. And Lord, I also pray for our, 
for our meal that we're about to eat and share food together, Lord, that you'd bless it, that you'd bless our fellowship with one another, that you'd help us to become closer to each other, Lord Jesus. And Lord, by all means, if there be anyone here that's not saved today, I ask, Lord, that the, the preaching of your word would pierce their heart, that they would come to you, that they'd repent, and their life would be changed forevermore, Lord, that they would be saved. And, and whether they had go through the fire and have nothing when they come to you, or they go through the fire and have many things because they put their time to you serving you, Lord Jesus, that they would be saved, Lord. In Jesus' name 